I'm as crazy as Fraser is. Um, thank you very much, Fraser. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, tell you about some of the work that we are doing in the group. I've tried, I've changed my talk a little bit, actually, and tried to talk a little bit more about how I'm thinking about how molecular machines might impact my own area of interest, which is polymer science. So I'm just going to start by basically telling you what, as a research group, we're interested in. Um, to kind of summarise our overall themes, we're really interested in precision chemistry. And when I don't just mean small molecule precision, I actually also think about polymer um, synthesis precision, be that in the chemistry, the block lengths, the, the functionality that we can embed, and thinking about how we can use programmable synthesis to access these well-defined polymers, and then thinking about how we can then move up the length scales and use those precision building blocks to build higher order structures. So we can build these, these polymer nanoparticles which have either confined environments with high functionality, or start to think about precision assembly of really quite complex anisotropic materials, and then also moving up to these sort of um, large responsive um, polymers that can be used in actually quite advanced technological applications. And in particular, this is a material that we, we've been collaborating with BP that's scheduled for deployment in a field, um, an oil well field, um, in a couple of years, which is quite exciting. So we work very much at that interface of poly polymer synthesis. I'm sure you're all aware we're very much living in the age of polymers, so this is a really interesting quote from um, Guillaume Nada from the uh, Nobel Prize in 1963, about if, you think about, if, we just, if we think about defining the age we live in, it's the age of polymers, it's the age of plastics. Yeah? And this is, this is great, as I said, it, and it has enabled great technological advantages, advantage, advantages, but it's also created a massive problem. As you all know, I'm sure you're all very familiar with the, the polymers problem, in the sense that we have, there's lots of quite terrifying predictions about the amount of plastic in the oceans and the, the effect of microplastics and, and, and plastic waste generally on our environment. And as someone who makes polymers, it's quite disturbing because I'm just contributing to that and making more polymers. So I think it's, it's a, a good chance to, to think about, well, we make all these polymers, um, how, what's our responsibility um, for uh, the polymers we make and uh, start to think more holistically about polymers in general. And one of the statistics that I find quite amazing, being a polymer scientist and just we make lots of really interesting, I'd say really functional, responsive polymers. If you look at this annual global production of polymers, and this is around where Nada made his prediction, we have this 20-fold increase, and this is only up to 2013, so it's kept going. But um, the most remarkable thing is that of all, over 90% of all the polymers that have ever been made are these polymers. And these are, these are great materials. These are materials that, that make up the fabric of uh, the world we live in, but they're not that functional. They, 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 they serve a purpose. They are low-value bulk materials that provide, um, uh, provide lightweight, low-cost um, things that we can, we can that improve our lives. Yeah, but so we, but we now have a polymers problem because we just make more and more of these cheap, unfunctional, low-value, and we don't have a very positive relationship with polymers in that we see them as low-value, not very not very functional, not, not of value, yeah? But if you think about it, one of the interesting things, and this is what inspired me probably close to about 10 years ago, and we started to think about, well, nature makes polymers. These are all some of nature's polymers, nucleotides, proteins, carbohydrates. Nature doesn't have a polymers problem. We make these, and these are three of the, the most commonly made um, uh, polymers. We have a polymers problem, nature doesn't. So we think about why that might be the case. We can start to look at the structures and this starts to help us understand why the polymers we make are um, basically low value sort of bulk materials. If you look, there's, okay, there's functionality in the backbones, but they're not particularly complex. Yeah, there's no stereochemistry, there's, uh, there's no sequence specificity, and if you think the good example of sequence specificity in proteins, that sequence specificity leads to advanced function. We don't do that in polymers. We make bulk materials and we think about how we control the molecular weight and dispersity, but not actually the placement of monomer units within the building blocks. So we basically make things that are much lower value, or a lot, much less complex, actually. When you think about, well, um, why is that the case? Well, it's actually based on the, the methods that we use to make polymers. So by and large, you make polymers with just an initiator and a monomer. So this is just the yellow people are initiators. You activate them, and they just add monomer units. It's an uncontrolled, chaotic process without control. Yeah? And you can make, you make, these, you make polymer chains, and you see here they've got a range of different molecular weights. In a second, if they ever finish, yeah, a range of different molecular weights. It's a, this is just a chain growth polymerization, yeah? And this is great, okay? This is great, and you can make bulk materials with this. 
been lots of advances where you actually, the big breakthrough in polymer science was controlled radical polymerization. So you now add in some sort of capping agent that allows you then to start to cap, and the caps are these green things that basically terminate the radical, and then you can add, keep adding monomer units. And this is, this is, was a hugely changed the way we make polymer science, and so now you can make polymers that are all the same length, yeah? And this is very easy. Again, it's, but it's still really very simple. Yeah, and this is, these, these, these bulk sort of chain growth methods don't allow for real precision. My own group have been interested in precision polymers for quite a while, and one of the tricks, this is one, it's just one example from my group, there's a number of groups thinking about this, where you can use essentially a slow propagating monomer, and you can add in at specific time points, fast propagating monomers. This is not sequence control, this is precision. This allows for some um, precision functionality of, of chains, but really, very few of them actually look like this. There's a distribution. So the, the, the fundamental polymerization methods that we use as polymer science don't allow us to get to the complexity of sequence or function that nature does. And if you think about how nature makes polymers, it uses the ribosome, and just in this case to make um, uh, proteins. And it uses a mixture of compartmentalization and templation to program and make a polymer of a particular sequence. And nothing that we do in polymer synthesis is this complex or has this ability to program a sequence. And this was something that we were inspired by a number of years ago. And one of the first, one of the, one of the things that we've been looking at, it, taking it from a very much a polymer science point of view, could we think about using templation and confinement using conventional chain growth strategies to allow for control of polymerization? And we used a very simple example where essentially we confined active radicals in polymer micelles so that only the blues within the circles can react, although, as I said, because you essentially have a confinement effect, and then you can start to make polymers of controlled length without having to add in the conventional chemical um, deactivators that allow you to um, control molecular weight. And that works and works quite well. So we published that a number of years ago. The key thing is you have to have a templation effect. We, we use this complementary nucleobase interaction to drive the monomers in towards the, into the core to allow for confinement, and then we polymerize and can create these very high molecular weight polymers with very low dispersity. But again, this is just essentially a really complicated way to control molecular weight. It doesn't get us in to think about sequence. So um, a number of years ago, um, I started a collaboration with Andrew Turberfield at the University of Oxo Oxford, as a, and as a physicist, he thought about synthesis in a very different way. Traditionally, as a chemist, I always think about, well, if I want to make something, I make, if I wanted to make lots of different things, I make them in different pots, yeah? Different round bottom flasks. That's how we, we think about, and our spatial separation, essentially, of different vessels controls our product formation. But if we look to nature, nature uses um, much more elegant compartmentalization strategies and also hybridization reactions to allow for selective reactivity within a single pot of multiple reactions. So in this is um, this um, RPS system, we essentially have this specificity by RNA hybridization or indeed DNA templated synthesis. And the concept of D DNA templated synthesis has really been pioneered by David Liu in Oxford. And he showed really elegantly that you consider if you have um, uh, uh, chemistry is attached to DNA strands um, in a very low lo local um, concentration. You could use selective hybridization to bring reactive functionalities together to allow for then um, reactions to occur. And the key thing is you can program the order in which you bring these things together to allow for coding towards embedding sequence within, within your materials. So the idea is you imagine you just have a load of monomers that you want to react. These, these do not need to be amino acids. These do not need to be. These can be any functionalities that you're, you're adding together to try and form a polymer. You imagine using sort of your DNA, you add DNA to them to, to give them a code. So then you can read each individual monomer with an individual code. We think about it from a polymer perspective that we start with a propagation and then we should just be able to propagate. One of the key things we realized quite early on is that to allow for effective propagation and program it, we need to be able to program through the um, introduction of an instruction and then a chemistry. So there's no way, we've not found a way to be able to um, uh, add a molecule and then read what the next, uh, determine what the next molecule is from the last chemistry. And we actually didn't want that. We wanted to have a very generalized system that we could use it, make any, form any bond and then have, a, then have an instruction that told us the next bond to make. And that was, that was a key, a key um, concept for us. 
And if we think about what we could do, if we could make this artificial ribosome, which is what we were very much tailored around, is if you look, if you think about the, oh, the ribosome can do all, do all these things really brilliantly. And this is just um, taken, this is David Liu's really beautiful um, uh, molecular rituxian. And as I said, that, that can do, it can do a lot of these things. It's not gene control, but it can do some really lovely work with unnatural products. It's pro progressive. It's got can get conditional progression, which is important. It's very efficient and reaction dependent. We wanted, to we wanted to start to think about actually using gene control to allow us to access a much broader range of um, polymer space and start to think about reaction dependency and really long products. And this is, this is where our, our goal has been focused. And I think there's real opportunity using um, molecular uh, machines to be able to try and build in these, these, um, these sequential reactions to allow to build up functionality. And I should say, this is not, I think, a tool, and if there ever will be a tool to make 10 grams of a sequence controlled material, we see it at this point as a discovery tool. One of the challenges we have is even if we could make sequence materials, how on earth do we know what sequence to make? My lab can do 100 polymerizations in a day, easy. But there's no point just doing more and more if we don't understand which ones. And I think we have a responsibility to think about what we're making and try and make and think about discovery rather than just the typical, just make more and more and more. So as I said, this is, this, is, this is the concept that we've been working on for a while. And we have an autonomous system that we, we did, uh, published and developed with Andrew Terrorfield a couple of years ago that is based on this concept of having um, a, a mixture of DNA um, uh, strands that autonomously can, upon triggering, can, can build up a programmable sequence that we've defined into the system. So we have this initiator and cargo strand, and this is where the growing oligomer forms. I've taken out all the chemistry, so yeah. And then instructions, and the key thing is we have these hairpin loops where we have um, and toe holes, and basically this, these instructions are what actually define what sequence we make. And then the, the, the final chemistry strands have our basically our A's and B's. These are, these are reactive groups that we're trying to add to make and grow our um, oligomer. So what we, what we have at the start, and this has been programmed to design, so we have this all in the one pot at the start. And the color coding here is that if they're the same color, they'll hybridize, yeah? If you see, there's, there are lots of, yes, there's a red region there and a red region there, but that's hidden in the loop, so it can't hybridize. So if you look at all, if you look at all these um, DNA strands, there's only one that can actually hybridize, which is this, which is an, our initiator cargo complex, which adds the first instruction, which then opens that blue loop, which then can add, so you, 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 you then have this sequential instruction and then chemistry strand. And I've got a video to try and show that, which I'm going to try and walk, talk through if I can see if I can do this right. So as I said, we have our initiator and our chemical building block, and then all our instruction hairpins, and then our chemistry hairpins. And when we have these both in solution, this is, these are the first, the only thing that can occur is this hybridization between these complementary um, strands. We get a branch migration and opening to open this loop, which then recognizes this blue strand. We bring the building blocks into close proximity, the formation of this holiday junction, then opens another strand. And then this reads the next instruction, brings the next instruction in. And this autonomously happens through the, by, by, by pre and programming this instruction reaction and chemical sequence. So we then can build up this ABC oligomer. And this just is read out here then in the, in the DNA strand. And the key thing is in this is that we have, and the key, mech, the key principle I think that we have to embed is this, is that we have this, this cycle um, of um, hybridization loop opening and recruitment. That one cycle does nothing, basically essentially programs, and then the second one is actually the chemistry strand. And it is, sorry, the, the thing that actually makes the bonds, yeah? And this alternation of instruction and chemistry allows us to basically pre-program any sequence that we want, yeah? And we can do it, uh, that, um, uh, um, uh, deterministically, and we can also make oligomers and, and polymers, etc. And this works and works well, and one of the key things is that the oligomer that we make, and this is where I say it's a discovery tool, because the oligomer that we make, we make pickamoles of it, so tiny, tiny amounts. But we have a DNA strand that basically we can, we can read what that DNA sequence is and then um, read back based on the instructions we started with to work out what the oligomer that we formed is. So this means we can do this, we can do multiple um, and libraries of these uh, sequence controlled materials and pick out um, uh, uh, particular functions that we might be looking for based on, and we don't need to make enough of the, the oligomer to, uh, to um, be able to characterize what's challenging, we can just use the DNA strand as our characterization tool. So where are, we, where are we at with this? We can do some combinatorial synthesis and read back. That's great. 
but it, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The key message is the machines are brilliant. These molecular assemblers work brilliantly. The chemistry is what lets us down, and actually it's t working them together is actually very, very difficult. Um, what, what, what could we do with this, and this is where I think sort of put out there, I think this is one of, the, one of the, some of the exciting things that could be done, if we can imagine doing gene, uh, single gene programming, we can really start to get really huge library sizes, start to think about selection, and even evolution, if we think about just standard sort of spit pull um, evolution strategies, we could really start to think about discovering materials and discovering what sequences will give in interesting function, rather than just having to iteratively synthesize each of them in the lab. So that's where I think certainly molecular machines have an input if we think about um, uh, material synthesis. And I think the concept of sequence is a, a degree of complexity that we often don't think about in polymers, but I think we need to start to if we want to start to think about, as I said, getting a bit, ma making our polymers higher value and of more interest. And the, the other two sort of basic concepts that nature has in its polymers is that of sustainability and stereochemistry. And I just want to give a quick couple of slides and how I also think there's elements within that that I think we also need to consider. And if we think about sustainability, and um, if we think about how, how um, the short time scale which we use our plastic water bottle for, compared to the how long it takes for that the raw material to make that water bottle takes, we're at completely different time scales. Nature uses amino acids that, for, for, say, for polypeptides that it can, it can um, use, polymerize, and then regenerate very easily. And so polylactide is a chemistry that we use, but one of the interesting things with polylactide is that it has stereochemistry, and nature uses stereochemistry and the arrangement of atoms in space to allow for added function. And as I said, it, that's very true as well if you think about just rubber. But just the last thing to show is that stereochemistry actually nature directs um, assembly, so you can think about just that of viruses, but you also can do that in polymer science. So by carefully tailoring the stereochemistry of your polymer, you actually can start to make some really interesting, precise, polymer nanostructures of quite unusual shapes. And this is just from playing about with the, the stereochemistry of the polymer. The chemistry is the same. So I, I, I would urge that I think we need to think more around um, the, the complexity of the, pol of the monomer units um, uh, and not necessarily just think about new chemistries. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. So I make comment. Uh, I think I can absolve you some of the responsibility for polluting the planet with plastic. <laughs> I think this is largely society's doing, and I say this because I was brought up before plastic. At least the only one that was on the globe was Bakelite, and uh, mm. it wasn't a very good one. And it uh, scunders me to use a Scottish word to go to Whole Foods across <laughs> there, buy something in plastic, and then I get to the cash out, uh, cashing out. And they want to wrap it in more plastic. And then when I fly my 365,000 miles, United insists that I want some um, cheese and biscuits, hmm. or what's called crackers. We get two crackers in such tough plastic <laughs> that you are killing yourself for the next half hour. <laughs> two biscuits, two crackers out. It is a real fault. Maybe we could make self-opening plastics yeah, that you yeah. could... Yeah, we've got to get rid of this, what do they call it, single-use... Single, yeah, yeah. yeah but it's because we... no need for it, right? Yeah. So let's start the movement in this room, get yeah. rid of all this nonsense. Questions? Hey, Rachel. What's on? No, um, so discovery is great. How do we go from discovery to production once you've got your perfect polymer? No. Honestly, I have no idea. I think that it's... Well, I think actually if we, can do, if we discover and know what to make, standard polymerization chemistries are good enough to be able to make that one thing or that... Two. It's been able to... Because actually the, the, a lot of the, the basic chemistries are really good. So actually the, I think whatever we discover that is good. I think, chem I think the, the toolbox of chemistries we have will probably allow us to make that on scale. It's just knowing what. It's, it's, whether, it's how we can then, I don't think we can do such um, kind of manipulations on, and, um, on, on scale. It has to kind of has to be a second a sort of external scale up step, I think. But I'd love to think if there are ways to be able to, because we, we can't reuse our DNA, we can't error correct. There's so many things I'd love to do we can't do. So yeah, but yeah, if we could, it would be great. And I guess the second question is, how do you 
question would be, well, it should have been the first one before I think about it, but how much material do you need to produce in the discovery phase to actually assess their properties? It depends what application you're looking yeah. at, I guess. Yeah. So a lot of the application that we've been looking at at the minute is just, is just simple binding. So of to either a, a protein or, or, or we've also been looking at whether these things have any higher order structure because I actually think the thing that sequence will allow us to do is actually think about reconfiguring our polymers into a particular conformation which then we know I think will then add enhanced properties. So a lot of the, this is this is what we're starting to try and look at now and I guess one of the things we're hoping is that we can do sort of an initial screen and then we may start to then we, we, can, we can start to think about slightly larger scale, just, yeah, the medium scale, yeah, is, I'm hoping, yeah. Yeah, so maybe a, kind of just a general comment slash question is the sustainability problem, is that something that molecular machines can help with? I guess the difference between um, nature is yeah. the way there's enzymes that break them down, yeah. and we, But I, th I think if we, because I think a lot of the, the, sta the standard polymerization methods we use make carbon backbone polymers. If we think of different ways to make the polymers, when we then start to be able to think about different way, different chemistries in the backbone that might be allowed to be selectively degraded. So I guess it's, it's coming back to kind of the, if we make polymers in a different way, we should be able to degrade them, reuse them, et cetera, in a much more um, uh, uh, um, responsible way.